Um, I, I, the assignment I have is, is to somehow or another uh, get back to where we were when I left. And it's, it's a huge assignment um, because I, I, I want to pick up where we left. But somehow or another, it requires a review. And, and perhaps in prayerfully, you have a copy of the summary in, in, your, in your hands. I've made a summary of where we've been since looking at Revelation chapter 2, where the Apostle John writes for us concerning Jesus' evaluation of the church. That he said to the Ephesus church, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. If you don't have a summary, the ushers have a copy of that. If you just stick your hand up, they'll be more than happy to get you a copy of that. But you'll see in the summary that um, in Revelation chapter 2, where Jesus said, I, I've got this against you. There are a lot of things you do good, a lot of things he commends the church for. But then on the other hand, um, there's stuff that, that is, is out of order, that, that needs to be adjusted. And so he, he calls them, um, reminds them in this evaluation in Re Revelation chapter 2. He said, you've left your first love. And he warned them to remember. He told them to remember where you have fallen. He told them to repent of their fall, of their drifting away, and to return by doing the first works. And so the first works is basically what we're, we're looking to accomplish. What are those things that can reinvigorate the love and the passion for Jesus Christ? What is it? What is it that will, will um, stir the fires of, of love and passion for Jesus Christ? And I say stir <clears throat> because we, there, there is a law that, that is at work in us and in our world, and it's called the, uh, the law of second, I'm sorry, the um, thermodynamics, the second law of thermodynamics, which says all things are winding down in and of themselves. If you do nothing, if you do nothing, I, I um, have a plant um, in, in, um, at, a, at our house, and for a couple of months I had it outside, but I've done nothing with it, nothing. And it shows. It shows. Things left by themselves without someone inculcating and creating um, a quickening, a making alive, that things will die in and of themselves. You and I, you and I in our spirits and minds, if you don't, if you don't in take some initiative, this is what I'm getting at, if you don't take some initiative to stir the passion for Jesus Christ, if you're not doing some things to keep your love for God and your love for Jesus Christ alive and well and growing, if you don't do something, it will be just like a fire. If you don't put some logs on it, it's going to burn out. And so the question was, what are those first works? He, he, he alluded to that Jesus says, I want you to do what you used to do, those first works. And so we've been after that um, over the past times we, we've met together relative to this study. And those seven things that I've come up with um, by, by way of the God's word, it, it seems to suggest, now there probably are more. I, I would dare say there are probably more. But whatever they are, whatever those things are, those first works, it should include these seven. What are those seven things? You'll see them on your summary. Seeking Jesus. You will never, you will never grow in your love for Jesus if you do not pursue him. And you can't pursue him as a part-time job. You can't pursue him when you get a chance. See, the problem with the Ephesus church, they left their first love. He left, they left their priority. The priority is that Jesus should have first place any and all times, at all times. Let me, let me share with you this, this little uh, illustration of my point. And please don't be offended. But it's what I've come to learn. It's what I've come to understand. But I want you to see it as an illustration of this point. There is absolutely not a time in your life when Jesus should not be in command and, pr and in priority. Not a time. Let me illustrate the point. 
My wife is my first lady. Listen to me. Listen to me. Now I'm speaking to you gentlemen. My wife is not your first lady. Come on, work with me. Work with me. Come on, come on now. Come on, work with me. Your wife is your first lady. There is not a time when your wife should take second place to any woman. I don't care if it's President Obama's wife. There is no context in which your wife takes second seat to any woman for any reason. Let me suggest this. We, we the church, we, we, have, we have taken on a worldly thought, a concept. It sounded good when the president says, or the wife of the president is called the first lady. But I want you to know that in no context is Michelle Obama my first lady. Did you hear what I said? In no context is Jesus second to anyone, to anything. He should have priority, first place at all times. And, and the only way to do that is in pursuit of him. And if you're not pursuing him first and foremost, beyond every, in fact, Jesus said himself in Matthew 6, 33, what? Seek what? First. First. Make that first, the first thing tomorrow when you get up. What's the first thing you will do? Seeking the kingdom of God. Everything else should, should fall in place when, when you put him first. So it's this idea, and I don't want to preach every item here, but, but God knows, God knows you can't love Jesus if you're not seeking him. You can't love him. You can't stir those embers if you're not sacrificing for him. To follow Jesus, it will cost you something. And I think he, he can be quite, quite offended by, um, by, by parsimonious Christians. The word parsimonious means cheap. See, I, try, I tried to dress it up a little. And I'm not talking about financial offering. I'm talking about you being cheap with your life. You'll spend, you'll spend an inordinate amount of, of money and time on you. Let me go back to another illustration, something I used last week. I enjoyed myself for three, close to three and a half hours out at a ball game rooting for the Chicago White Sox. Now, don't be mad at me. I flip. I flop. I, I'm all over the place, you know. I've got a, I got a, a Chicago Cubs hat now, and, you know, I'm so glad they're in first place. You, you, you know, I, I mean, yeah, but, but I was rooting for them. Three and a half hours, and it never occurred to me. The time went by so fast, and you know why? I enjoyed myself. I was having fun. And one other thing. See, my being at that game was about me. It was for my pleasure. But it's interesting how we come to the house of God and, and we, we want to put God on a, on a, on a, 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 a time, on, on a watch. You see, because when we come here, you know what? It's not about us. It's about him. It's about his pleasure. And, and so how is it that, that we can spend an inordinate amount of time on things that make us happy, and then when it comes to serving God, living for him, we want to we be parsimonious and dole out a cheap offering to God of our time and who we are. You and I ought to be ashamed. How dare I sit in front of, of the Chicago White Sox and enjoy them and not sit in the presence of God, not be able to sit in his presence, still. In fact, Habakkuk said what? Be still and know that I am. How dare, how dare any one of us? And then we got a, we got a nerve to get up and walk out early. That's an offense to God. He doesn't dismiss anyone out of his presence. How dare you leave without his benediction? without his blessing what is that what is that he is god he is lord i don't care who you have to meet i don't care who you have to see he's priority what does it look like what does it sound like priority sounds like me opening my mouth in this house of worship how can you dare sit silence in the presence of the king Shame on us. One of the, one of the uh, bishops, back when he was serving God 
in the church during the reign of King Henry VIII. Now, King Henry VIII was a, an abusive, arrogant, wild, just arrogant, proud, mean. He would kill you in a moment. <laughs> if, and then think nothing of it. He had absolute sovereign power. Bishop, Bishop Hugh Latimer, as he's preparing, he knew that King Henry VIII was in his presence. Yes, the story tells us, historians tell us, that Hugh Latimer, Bishop Hugh Latimer, said to himself, Latimer, 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 be careful what you say. The King of England is in your presence. And then another voice came to Bishop Latimer. Latimer, 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 be careful what you say. The King of Kings is in your presence. Beloved, we're before the King. Be careful what you say and what you don't say. Utter your mouth, open your mouth, let him hear your praises. Saints, 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 <laughs> be careful what you say. <laughs> the King of Kings is before us. Yeah, you can't, you and I can't grow. It's going to cost you. I'm just telling you that up front. It will cost you. It will cost you to serve Jesus. And then the third, the third point, and this is as far as we've gotten, it's the idea of suffering for Jesus. Suffering for him. <laughs> now, suffering in general is not what I'm talking about. To, to be drawn closer to Jesus. I, I love what Paul said. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, he says this, this is his longing. His longing is that I may know him. That, that word no, is, it, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a term of deep passion. So it's not just an intellectual ascent. It's not just thinking, know him intellectually, but I want to know him deeply and intimately. Paul said, in order to know him, I want to know him in his suffering. I want to know. How, how, to, to know him deeply is to experience the suffering of Jesus Christ. And what does that look like? When, when we think of suffering, sometimes we, we um, mistakenly confuse it with our own suffering. And I always want to um, clarify that. that it's just, not, it's not, not, just not the truth. It's just not true that um, suffering with cancer is, is suffering for Jesus. It, it's, it's just not. No, it's not. Cancer is a derivative of, of a fallen nature. I'm, I'm, I'm a broken um, um, being, and, and it's just not. It's just not. It's, it's the results of sin in, 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 the, in the environment, in, in my life, in my body. Um, Jesus, God said that the, 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 the body will return to the dust. We're all condemned to die. Something's going to take us out of here. And so that kind of physical suffering is not what, what we're talking about here. That's not what Paul is talking about. The kind of suffering he's talking about is suffering because of who Jesus Christ is, suffering on his behalf. What, what does that look like? Suffering for the cause of Jesus Christ. That's, that's where we, we left this, um, this outline and to suffer for Christ is to experience just what Jesus said. Jesus said, they will hate you because they hated me. They will despise you. But Jesus had counted all joy when they revile you and persecute you and, and, and say all manner of evil against you. What? Falsely. Great is your reward in heaven. See, when, when we get persecuted for identifying and, and associating with Jesus Christ, we will suffer. The question, the question I, I have, and I, I, Lord knows I'm not going to finish this, but the question I have this morning, and I kind of wanted to bounce in, into this uh, message by asking this question, why is there suffering? Why, why do the people of God suffer? 
and 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 I'm talking again about suffering for Christ, which which reminds me again. I just want to reiterate this point, just to let you know. I I I was doing some reading while I was gone, and I'm just just trying to give some account for my time. Don't want you to think that I you know I was just on, on a beach somewhere and um, uh, working on suntan or whatever, but. You know, Lake Michigan is a beautiful place. But let me get back to this. Um, uh, yeah, when, when, when I went away, a few books I was reading, one of them is called When Life Falls Apart uh, by Warren Wiersbe. And in his book, in his book, um, he, he has this outline. Um, he, he calls it, in his chapter two, it draw, drew my attention. Um, to you who hurt. He's writing this to those who are suffering. And, I, and he's talking about physical suffering, but it also gets into spiritual suffering where we're suffering for Jesus. But then he moves into the uh, chapter two called the really big question. The really big question. And this is, again, he's addressing the issue of physical suffering, but mostly. But that's, that's not what our discussion is about. But I, I just want to draw your attention to this, this idea. When, when Warren Wiersbe, I'm ex- tries to answer this question, the really big question. What is that really big question? And, and here it is. Here it is in chapter 2. Why do bad things happen to good people? There, 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 are, there are, are saints across this world that are suffering um, because they, they have identified with Jesus Christ because they're, they're preaching in Islamic countries, in countries that are, are not sympathetic to the, uh, the right of a person to worship freely. Um, and, and there are many Christians who die, who lose their possessions, lose their family, because they just merely attend a worship gathering like this. They suffer. And, and the question is asked, why do bad things happen to good people? And he goes on to explain, and, and I, I love his, his, his thinking, but I think he missed part of, part of the, the um, answer. I, I think his, his answer is incomplete because his question is, the premise of his question is incorrect. Why do bad things happen to good people? See, the premise assumes that we are good. Yeah. Beloved, none of us are good. Amen. None of us are good. And, 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 and get this, get this, that you and I are not entitled to what we have. And I tell you, America is spoiled because there is a sense of entitlement. Because, and, and because there's, there's a sense that somebody owes you this. We're not good people. God, God, God has already declared that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There are none good. No, not one. So in actuality, the, the question ought to read, why does bad things happen to bad people? And it seems to solve itself. Happens to bad people because what? We, we're bad. They're, 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 we, we, we are, we're not worthy to have what we have. It's nothing but the grace of God that, that today that we're not in hell, beloved. If, if, you, if, you, got, if you stood before God and said, Lord, I, I want what, what, what I deserve. I, I, I want what, I, what you owe me. God owes us hell. The fact that he gives us more grace upon grace super abounding in our lives we're not entitled to it but there is a sense that after receiving the the bounty of god's goodness and grace there is a sense where we get to the point where what well, why does that bad thing happen why would you let me get this or get that why is this happening Beloved, you and I, there's not a point, there's not a point in time, no matter what kind of pain, no matter what kind of our struggle we're in, no matter what we're facing, no matter what we're suffering from, there's not a time where you and I shouldn't give praise to God. Don't you dare put him, don't you dare put him on the, on the jury stand or on the witness stand to give an account. Why would you let this happen in my life? Who are you that he has to answer to, that he has to justify his actions to you? When you and I deserve hell, you ought to give him praise that you're not in it. And I don't mean you literally. I mean you generally. I mean me too. 
we ought to give him praise that we're not in hell this this idea of, of suffering um, on behalf of Christ why why does it happen what is the cause of, of suffering this kind of of suffering where for instance in in the life of Jesus himself what what is it that that Jesus had to endure such such hatred and hostility now now if, if ever there's a question if ever this question should be asked it should be asked about Jesus <laughs> why does bad why did those bad things happen to that good man now that, that there, there's the question there's the question and and and, and that's that's what I'm, I'm I'm getting at that's what I'm getting at so th there is no 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 reason why um, evil the hostility and the, the arrogance the hatred of man should 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 extend itself even even to God. They they hate God. There is this antipathy that that's natural in in our spirit toward God. Hatred, hatred. That's what He saved us from, beloved. Just a natural antipathy toward God. Jesus stood before Pilate. They beat him. They smote him. Pulled out his beard nailed him to a cross, humiliated him, naked there he was on a cross, hanging. <laughs> a good man. But, but why? But why? Peter, why uh, here they're proclaiming the gospel and, and, and in Acts chapter 4, I, I want you to read it when you can, Acts chapter 4, ver beginning with verse, verse 13, they heal a man and they wanted to know um, why and what power did you use to, to heal him? They call them into question. How is it that you can do this? And what name did you do this? And they said, well, we did it in the name of Jesus Christ. That man you crucified. And they warned them, look, don't you, don't you, look, don't, don't you, don't you preach that. They commanded, the, the, the rulers of, of that religion, Judaism, commanded them, do not preach that message. And, and the same thing with the Apostle Paul. What, what is it? What, one of the things that, that happens and, and that is historically true, and we're, we're going to get to the text here in 1 Peter uh, chapter 5, um, but, but what is it? What is it about, about the, the Christian faith that, that invites the censure of the world? Why? And, and, and to the extent that that believers suffer what is that why does that happen why does that happen and and the the whole idea the reason why is is that authoritarian governments religious systems and and social trends stand in opposition to god's authority Totalitarian rulers, kings, governors, presidents, whether they're totalitarian or whether they rule by, by um, whether some rule by, by fiat, they can do what they want, when they want to, whomever. Others rule by legislative power, as it were, power that's given to them. And, and yet they take that power and they use it in such a way, they wield it in such a way as to, as to punish anyone that would dare oppose their authority. And, and so a great example of this is Rome. Rome, Rome um, in the first century was, was authoritarian as a, as a state government. And they expected, they expected total and complete loyalty from all of its subjects throughout all of the Roman Empire. One of the ways you would do that would, would be basically you had to burn incense and and uh, commit yourself as commit yourself to to um, being a loyal subject of Rome, and so everyone would know that you're a royal subject when they see you going into the temple to burn incense to to Rome and to Rome's Caesar. They expected complete loyalty. Rome also had a pantheon, what was called. Um, uh, just just a, a place where all the gods, all the gods, 
were gathered in this building called the Pantheon. Rome didn't mind you worshiping God. In fact, Caesar became a god. He wanted to worship. They didn't mind you worshiping. They had all the gods in the Pantheon. And they would say to the, the subjects of Rome, choose, choose which God you want. But anyone that you choose, I want you to know that every one of them in that pantheon, every one of those gods in that pantheon are subject to the authority of Rome. Amen. Jesus comes along and his followers, and Jesus declares that his authority, what? Yeah. Is above the authority of Rome. They could not have that. And his followers, his followers, they were expecting his followers to burn incense. They were expecting his followers, the, the followers of Jesus Christ. That's why so many Christians died in the first century, because Rome was not going to have disloyalty. They wanted complete and total control over the masses of people. And so they wanted you to identify yourself as a loyal subject of the Roman government. And you had to submit yourself. And that what that does, it sets up an antagonism. It sets up a conflict. It sets up a sense of aggression and an antipathy, a sense of, of hostility that, that is, exists between the state and, and the church, the state and believers, because believers just will not submit. Authentic believers, authentic believers will not submit themselves to that authority. Amen. When there's a choice, in fact, um, Peter said this. They told him to, um, look, you've got to, you, you're going to stop this preaching. We, they beat him. After they beat him, they said, look, no more preaching. And he said to them, look, if you think obeying you before I obey God, he basically told them, that's, that's, your, that's your thing. But basically he said, for me, I obey God first. Amen. Peter was willing to take on the, the, the punishment and the ridicule of disobeying a law that was created to essentially separate the authority of, of state and church and put the state above the church. Daniel, Daniel went through the same thing. Daniel was told, they created a law, created a law that said what? No praying to any other God but, but you, but you, Amen. but the God of, of, uh, of Babylon at the time. And Daniel, Daniel went on praying. He went on praying. He did what he normally does. Yes, sir. And he was willing to suffer. If that's the law, then fine, I'll suffer for that. And, and the, point, the point being, the point I'm making here is that uh, this kind of hatred and an antipathy and uh, conflict comes as a result of a, a state, a Roman state, uh, or, or let's even say maybe a government like ours that, that feels like their authority exceeds God's authority. Amen. And with that in mind, I want to take you to 1 Peter, and forgive me for the long intro, but look, look at 1 Peter. I want you to look at 1 Peter as this, this wonderful text of uh, this letter written to people who were suffering under Rome's authority. Amen. And listen to what? Listen to what Peter says in the context of suffering. What does Paul, or rather Peter, say to these precious saints as they're scattered abroad, as they're scattered all over the place? What does he say to them? Look at 1 Peter chapter 5. Are you with me? First Peter chapter 5, I'm starting at verse 5. Peter writes, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be sub submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. 
for those that are suffering, one of the things that we do is we want to make sure that we're understanding the relationship we have to the body. Think of this. Think of this. He writes to these, this suffering band of, of authentic believers and tells them, submit yourselves, mutually submit yourselves to one another and be clothed with humility. This idea of mutual submission highlights the, the, the sense of what happens in the community of faith. That among believers, you and I are responsible to submit ourselves to one another and, and be clothed with a sense of humility. That none of us are, are to look down or, or to despise another person because of their perceived status. But we're, we're to humble ourselves and clothe our own minds. Put, put on what? What kind of clothing should we put on? Humility. Because God resisteth the proud. Amen. See, that, that's a relationship. It's, it's a, a relationship within the community of faith. And I, I just love the way these apostles write these letters, that they're not written necessarily first and foremost to one individual, at least not Peter. Peter's writing to a group. And so the church, the church now becomes the, the instrument, obviously, through which Christ will manifest his glory, but it's also the place that experiences suffering as a group. We don't suffer alone. Amen. We suffer, we suffer or rather, as, as a body. The scripture says, if anyone suffers, all what? Suffer. We suffer together. And if there's a brother or sister who's going through, every one of us should pick up that sense of, of their, their loss, that sense of their, their suffering, that sense of their pain, that sense of, of their, their um, uh, disappointment, or whatever it is, that this community of faith should experience that with the believer. It's, it's a community. Submit yourselves one to another. It's mutual submission. And then he goes, in, and he writes here in verse 6, the second relationship that's so important when we're suffering is the relationship to the Father. Relationship to the body is mutual submission. But then in the midst of suffering, we need to understand suffering in what context. L look, look at what he says here, verse 6. He says, therefore, humble yourselves. Not, now, now this, is, this is what? As, as a group, what? We humble ourselves as a group, which means in a group, you know what happens <clears throat> in a group, excuse me, in a group there is this, this uh, sense of, of uh, mutually kind of watching out for each other, that, that when, for instance, you see your brother or your sister sort of getting out of, out of, out of shape, bent out of shape, the body has a way of, of, of controlling that, speaking to that. Helping others to humble themselves. But, but again, the, 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 that can only happen in the context of, of community. Therefore, what? Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that may, he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. What is, what is the relationship for suffering people who are, are experiencing suffering Christ suffering, not, not just, now we're not talking physical suffering, we're talking about this band of believers who are experiencing the suffering that, that happens because they share the gospel. And somebody curses them out. Or they share the gospel. And, and somebody, somebody reports them to the authorities and, and they, lose, they lose their home and possession. What, what should a person, what should the, the body do the th first thing the body should do is, is to humble themselves before God. But, but he's suffering. Yeah, right. What do you do first? Humble yourself. See, humility is always in place. And we do it collectively under the mighty hand of God. What, what, is, what is he saying? That, see, God is sovereign. We're, we're to understand suffering at any level. As a sovereign will of God. God does not make mistakes. God's decisions are, are the best decisions, regardless of what you and I might think. And he says what? Humble yourselves. Collectively, corporately. How? Under the mighty hand of God. 
God is able. He can fix it. But if he chooses, I like what Job said, even if he doesn't. See, we, we've got to leave the decision, the sovereign decision about our suffering to God. Amen. Under his mighty hand that he may what? Exalt in due time. Casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. And then, and then here's the, uh, let's go to the third one. So, so there is a relationship with the father where we humble ourselves. And third, there is a relationship with the devil. Look at this. Look at this. In verse 8, he says what? Be sober. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Now, now think, think with me. He, he commands them, be sober. He, basically, he's, he's, the, the word would suggest this, that... <clears throat> There is a possibility that in the midst of suffering, the people of God can, can be under the influence of other intoxicants. Are you following me? He did use the word sober, right? He said, be sober. Stop what? Stop drinking. Now, I'm not talking about just alcohol. That, that's true, too. We should, not, we should not put ourselves under the control of any any kind of chemical or anything that takes our mind, our sense of sobriety from us. Amen. But now he's using soberness, though, in, in a metaphorical sense, in, in a spiritual sense, that spiritually we should have our right mind and not allow our minds to be influenced by false ideas and the intoxicants of the world. And he says what? Not only be sober, but what? Be vigilant, be watchful. Watch out. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now, if you're, if you're looking at the text and you're, if you're understanding the text, if, uh, um, your devil, or rather your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may, whom he may devour. Well, how, does he, how will he devour any believer? He will devour the believer where? In the mind. In the mind by ideas, concepts, perceptions, opinions. Many a believer today is intoxicated with the opinions of the world. Under, under the influence of, of an intoxicant that takes away a sense of their spiritual sobriety and they're no longer watchful and careful about who they are and who they belong to. Peter says what? Be sober. Be vigilant. Be watchful. Amen. Because the devil, your adversary, is walking about, and he's going to devour you. Many, many a believer today is under the influence. And then he says, be sober, be vigilant. Look at verse 9. This third, this third relationship. What's your relationship to the devil? Resist him. Amen. How? Steadfast in the faith. Resist him. What? Be steadfast. In fact, as I was reading this text, the original word that Paul used comes from the, uh, the, the root word, comes from the word where we get steroid. Take some spiritual steroids. What? Be steadfast. See, a lot of saints are just so wimpy, weak, wusses, spiritual wusses. And you will, you will always be defeated by Satan if you don't resist him and take that spiritual steroid and stand for Jesus. Resist him in the faith. Stand steadfast in the faith. See, what is the faith? The faith is the, the compilation of ideas. Truth that stands in opposition to the ideas promoted by, by the world truth it's the faith what resist him steadfast in the faith knowing that the same sufferings what sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood this is this is so interesting peter writes to a group of of uh, traveling uh, itinerant believers and he says to him the brotherhood 
are experiencing the same suffering. Why would that be? Because Rome is in ex exalting or ex exerting its influence throughout all of its territory. And he says to them, look, you're not the only one going through this. There are other brothers that are going through this. But I want you to resist him steadfast in the faith. One of, one of the things I, I uh, want to say here at this point and, and I want to sort of wind it down because I want to talk uh, real quickly about a couple of items. But uh, this idea, when he says, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. I, I, I think it's interesting <laughs> that he calls the saints brothers as a brotherhood. Why, why didn't he call them sufferings are experienced by your sisterhood? Can I say? See, brotherhood points out what? The, the, the gender, the dominant gender is man. Now, I know studies are saying that today women are dominant. Women are dominant because women now are, have many more degrees than men. Women are dominant now because they, they're making, a lot of women are making more money than men. Women are dominant now because they have positions in, throughout um, the, the public and, and private sector. And it, it's growing, it's growing. But, but as far as God is concerned, and you know what, I, I just thank God that, that the word of God is not politically correct. You know what, you know what, God, God, God's word is the most politically incorrect literature that you can find. God is, God is not political. And you, you know what? The last thing on God's mind is to be politically correct. He does not care who is offended. He doesn't think about that. The first thing on God's mind is his what? His glory. is the glory of God. And he expects that everyone will submit themselves to his authority, to his glory. And if you're offended by that, you need to do what? Check your attitude. Fix it. That's why he told those believers what? Humble yourself. Do an attitude check. Brotherhood. The brotherhood. Men are dominant. Men, are, men should be the dominant leaders when it comes to the faith. Women should not outnumber men in churches. We should, we should have more men in, in our midst. What, what, what is this? Because, because men, men are the dominant, the responsible, they're, they're, they've been given the responsibility to lead. Knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood. Now, when he says brotherhood, I mean he means men and women. But he identifies the men and the women as brothers. What, what does all this mean to us? I want to, want to how, how do we apply this? How do we just, you know, make some sense of, of what Peter is saying? And, and if I can just really quickly summarize, the idea here is that Peter is writing to people who are suffering because the government or, or social entities are putting pressure on them to conform. They need, they need to get in line. They, they need to fix their their understanding and, and submit themselves to the authority of, of the state on every matter. And there are, there are times, there are times when, when you and I as believers, we should obey Caesar. That's what Romans 13 says. Exactly what Romans, and in fact, Jesus said the same. They came to Jesus and said to Jesus, Jesus, should we, should, should we pay taxes? And, and, and Jesus, Jesus, said, Jesus said to them, show me, show me your money. Show me a piece of, the, I forgot what piece of the money it was, but he said, show me, show me that coin. Amen. And, and, and one, one of them pulled out uh, the, the piece of the coin, and he, Jesus asked this pertinent question. Don't miss it. Listen, 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 listen. Jesus said, Jesus said, whose image is that on there? That that was so, so profoundly wise. He said, he said to the man, he said to these Pharisees, scribes, Sadducees, he said to them, whose image is that? They asked him, well, should we pay taxes? And he said, well, whose image is on that money? 
And Jesus said, well, you, you render to Caesar his money. You give him his. And then he added, but you render to God what belongs to God. Now, now what, what is he saying? What, what is he saying? See, he said, whose image is on that, that money? But then whose image is on you? See, the image of God is on every person. And so, therefore, every person is responsible to render unto what? God his due, first and foremost. What does this do? What does this do for us? Here we are sitting on, on, at a, an incredibly um, um, dynamic and, and uh, I, I think, um, culture-altering um, place in, 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 our, in our times. Just incredible um, times in which we're living as, as we watch the, um, the events and things leading up to the election of, of our leader. And um, I, I wrote in, in the uh, message from the pastor uh, um, this, this idea when, when choosing our leaders. And what I want to do, I just want to real quickly take what we've learned from Peter and make application in, in terms of where we are. Um, and in this, this uh, article that I wrote here, when, when choosing leaders, we, we want to choose based on, not, not based upon a person. Okay? That, that's, that's, that's a, um, a fake. You know, that's, that's, that's like, like some of the quarterbacks. You know what makes some of the quarterbacks so great? Because they, they fake the ball as if they're giving it to the running back, and instead they keep it themselves, and the lineman didn't even see it. Amen. See, when, 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 when the community and when, when um, the media talks about the persons, it, it's really not what we should be focused on. Not, not what we should be focused on at all. What we ought to be focused on are, are the policies. What is it that they promote? And, and why do I say that? Because of what the text of Scripture says. What? The Scripture said, 1 Peter chapter 5, said what? Be sober. Be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. What is he talking about? The implication being this, that governments, that governments can influence a tremendous amount of of uh, unnecessary authority and power in the life of those who are believers. Let me, let me illustrate the point. Um, and, and the point being this, that in, in terms of policies, what you want to do, what you want to do is make sure that you're, when, when you're choosing your leader, you want to choose a leader who's going, who's going to essentially um, instill policies or promote policies that will, will not be in opposition to God's authority. That's what I'm trying to say. Forget about the people right now. Forget about the people. The first, the first thing is what do they believe? What do they stand for? What is their platform? What is their policy? And, and let that govern you. And, and so when, when you read through this uh, choosing your leaders, there are these three things you and I, as, as believers in, in this time, I, I want to suggest that you and I need to be governed by. Three things, and, and I'm, I'm virtually sure that you will agree um, as you read through this. And the question is, how should Christians vote? How should Christians choose their leaders? These are the three things we should use to govern our selection. And when we're, when we're, when we're looking, we're looking at these three things. One, the glory of God. How does either of the policies promote or hinder the glory of God. The, the second principle is the image of God. How do the policies promote or oppose the image of God? And the third is the kingdom of God. How do any of those policies promote or hinder the kingdom of God? And, and on the back of, of this, I, I gave you a couple of examples, for instance. And, and these, these stand out because they're the most prominent. They're the most prominent because they address, they are in opposition to the glory, the image, and the kingdom of God. The first one is that of abortion. 
Will you agree? Will you agree with me that every child is created in the image of God? When Jesus said whose image is on that, he's asking whose image is on every individual. So when anyone takes the life of a baby in the womb, they're essentially murdering. Back in the Old Testament, the god Molech required, required their worshipers to kill their children. The sad part about it is that Israel was, was, was getting entangled with this God and taking their children to Molech to have them killed. It's no wonder God was so upset with Israel. And so what we want to do is examine our, our, what we don't want to do, what, what we don't want to do, we don't want to um, support policies that are contrary to the word of God and to the glory of God. If God's image is on that baby, then what right do I have supporting the policy of Planned Parenthood? By the way, do you know that Planned Parenthood was created by Margaret Singer? Who in her, in her purpose was to reduce the number of black people in the world. And guess where they went? They went to the pastors in black communities so that those pastors could tell their, their, their um, constituents to support the Planned, Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood, in fact, you will not find Planned Parenthood in white communities. You will not find Planned Parenthood in Asian and Jewish communities. You find Planned Parenthood in black communities. What? Be sober. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Another, another policy that, that uh, stands in opposition to God, it's clear. And, and you know what? The community isn't necessarily talking about it, but I want you to know God is talking about it. You may not be thinking about it, but I want you to know it is important to God. His image, his glory, his kingdom, it ought to be first and foremost. See, that's, why, that's, that's the problem we have with, with, with what? the Ephesus church. They, left, they lost their first love. And if it's important to God, it ought to be important to you. Another example is same-sex marriage. Now, I know that happened a couple of years ago. And you know what? All right. What, what does that have to do with me today? It has everything to do. Because you know what it does? It's a, it's a direct assault against the, the, the glory, the image, and the kingdom of God. It goes in counter-distinction to the glory of God. God manifested his glory by creating a man and a woman. And it was through marriage of the man and the woman that God expected to manifest his glory throughout all the world. He told them to be what? Be fruitful and multiply. Same-sex marriage is a direct affront, a frontal assault against the glory of God. And how dare any believer support anyone, any policy that would be an attack against the glory of God. What? The scriptures is what? Be sober. Be what? Watchful. So this really isn't a question about Donald Trump. It's not a question about Hillary Clinton. It's about what you believe. It's about you. It's about you and me. About what we believe. Do we, do, will we, will we, we be sober and vigilant to protect what? The glory, the image, and the kingdom of God. And you and I should not support any, any group I remember, remember years ago, I, I, and, and, and yeah, I'm going to say it, I'm going to say it. Years ago, I used to be, I used to be a, a staunch Democrat. And, and you know what? You know, <coughs> your throat all right there, bro. Um, <laughs> years ago, years ago, I used to be a Democrat. And thanks be to my wife. You know what? My wife, I, I used to be a, a, a union rep. And union reps, you, you know what? You, you better be Democrat. And, and it used to be a Democrat. And, and my wife, and my, my wife's prayer and, 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 and just encouragement. And, and I, I came to the light. I, I looked at policies. And I, I, I said, now, why, why would I continue to be a, a part or, or known for my, for my support of a group that is an anti, a, antipathy to the, to the glory of God? I got out of the, the Democratic Party. And then I went to the Republican Party. And guess what? I'm no longer a Republican either. <laughs> Because, because they're moving in a direction that, that, that is, is not going to support the glory, the image, and the kingdom of God. And so now I stand before you as an independent. That's right. That's right. I'm not, 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 for, not, not for the Democrats, and I'm not for the Republicans. I'm for Jesus. 
And when I, when I go into that booth, I vote, I vote Jesus. And any, anybody that stands for things that are going to promote the glory, the image, and the kingdom, I think they've got my vote. And so my classifications, my factions, I'm not part of any alliance. I'm not part of any group or any association that stands in antipathy to the glory of God. Because when I stand before him, I want clean hands relative to, relative to my vote. And guess what, beloved? You and I, we're going to answer for, for every word and every deed you've done in this body. You're going to answer for who you vote for. So what, what's my word to you? And I'll sit down. Be sober. Stop drinking. Stop, stop, stop being led and influenced by the intoxicants of this world. Be vigilant and be sober. Be watchful. Because your adversary, the devil, is seeking to devour you. Where? In your mind. See, because if he gets your mind, brother, he's got you. He's, you're, 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 you're just toast. You're done. Father, um, we, we praise you today for the um, privilege that's ours to represent you in this culture. And I pray for every, every saint under the sound of my voice that you would grant the power of your spirit the courage, O oh God, to align themselves with you and the glory of God. 